So just for starters, I want to give some context. Uh, one of the things that we do in my group is to try to figure out what lives in, in dust or what's represented in dust from the life that's around us. And so we would do things like swab the dust right here. And if we swab this dust right here, if it's like other dust all around the world, we would find in that dust DNA from something on the order of 10,000 species of bacteria, 1,000 species of fungi, hundreds of species of insects, and hundreds of species in plant, of plants in this room. And what that represents is the number of species that are in this room alive at one point or another that then die and, and, and become part of dust and float around the room. What it also represents is a measure of what you're breathing in right now. And so you're breathing in thousands of species and then breathing them out. And some of them establish on you and some of them don't. Some of them can kill you almost certainly. Some of them benefit you to such an extent that if you really got rid of them that you would die. And most of them we have no clue. And in that context, I could spend most of my work studying applied things, aspects of how do we favor the good species and disfavor the bad things. But the truth is most of my work is actually basic. It's figuring out the ecology and evolution of these thousands of species that are in any room we go into. And so what I want to talk about today in the context of work on microbes and microbiomes, which I heard somebody say, what the hell is a microbiome? It's, so it's, a microbiome is just the assortment of microbes in some context, some habitat. And so you can talk about the gut microbiome. And it's really just the, the species in that forest of microbes. And so I could talk about many aspects of that. But what I want to talk about is why the, the work on the basic biology of these species that live around us every day, why it matters, why the context and blue sky work matters, and why it actually might be more important than some other kinds of work and ultimately a pr producing applied benefit. And so if you want to go to sleep now, because um, I, I know I made it kind of dark, the take home is that many of the species that live around you, species you disregard or maybe even actively dislike, have the potential to be of great help to humanity. But I think only if we know their natural history, consider them both in the light of the insights of ecology and evolution and in light of the needs of humanity. I'm going to now introduce a caveat, though, which is that I make big points in the context of long stories. And for a long time, I thought this was just my nature. And recently, I discovered a letter written by my great-grandfather. And it was in the context that his church in Greenville, Mississippi, had asked him to comment upon the history of that Lutheran church, that individual church. And in response, he wrote, in commenting upon the history of this church, I'd be remiss if I did not comment upon the history of Lutherans more generally. In speaking to the history of Lutherans in general, I feel as though I should speak to the history of Christianity. In mentioning the history of Christians, I should speak to religion. And in thinking about religion, I feel compelled to write about the history of man. <laughs> and so that's, those are my people. And, and so in getting to this, this superficially simple point, I'm going to take you on some detours. And the first detours I'm going to take you on are in the context of one part of my life. And so I live two lives. One is as a writer of books about science, and one is as a practicing scientist. And so we'll start with the writing life. And one of the excuses that writing about science gives me is I get to go into libraries, oops, and I get to, to read other people's work. I get to think about other people's stories and think about science that I'm not doing, but how it may relate to the science that I'm doing and that we all could do. And when I was a graduate student, one of these stories that came to me and really inspired this book was a story told to me by this guy, Peter Niskrensky. He was older at the time. This is Peter as a small boy. And, and these are two skinks that he actually inadvertently introduced to Poland, and they still live there. Um, but so Peter came back uh, to the University of Connecticut where I was a graduate student, and he, he came with a story that I then went and read more about. And it was a story of this guy, Oliver Zompro, who was a German graduate student. And Oliver was supposed to be working on stick insects, the basic biology of stick insects and their history and evolution. You couldn't get too much obs more obscure. 
And Oliver was looking through drawers, looking at stick insects, and decided, do I have a pointer on this? No. Decided that he would, he would, in addition to looking at the organized drawers that we imagine museums have, to look in the disorganized drawers that all museums also have. And when he did that, he found this creature. This is a, a creature in amber, and it was just in one of these messy junk drawers in the museum. And he looked at this when he was supposed to be looking at stick insects, and he got super excited, and he ran upstairs, and he told his advisor, you won't believe this, but I think I found a new order of life in the basement while I was supposed to be doing my thesis. And his advisor said, why weren't you doing your thesis? And he said, well, I watched this movie, Gladiator, and I got excited, and uh, this is true. And, and so I looked at this other drawer, and he, his advisor looked at this, and he didn't know what it was either, but it couldn't possibly be a new order. A new order would be like finding bats, not knowing that bats exist. It's not the kind of thing you do in the basement. But his advisor thought, well, let's check this out. And so they sent emails to other museums asking if people also had insects like this one. And this, this insect is an amber. You can see it's sort of nice color behind it, and which means it, it was collected and it might be extinct. We don't know how recent this amber is. Um, we don't know if it's still around. But then as they asked other museums if they also had these insects, an interesting thing happened. They got pictures of these insects from other museum junk drawers that were on pins, which meant at some point it had been collected alive, which meant this thing might be out there in the world. And so Z Oliver Zombro decides that he needs to go find this. And the good news is the first one of these specimens that they had a good label for was in the Brandberg Massif in the middle of Namibia that looks like this. It's a giant rock outcropping in the middle of the desert. And so if you're looking for a new order of life that might be extinct, that nobody's really studied, this seems like a great place to go because nobody's, nobody's bothered it. The problem is Oliver Zompro is a broke graduate student, and there's no way he can get to this place. And so this is when he found my friend Peter Niskrensky, who at the time worked for Conservation International and agreed that maybe this was a new thing. Maybe they could go look for it. And so Peter financed a trip to go look for this new order. And so they go, and they have these cards with these pictures on it of this potentially new kind of life. And they take them around, and they say to people, you know, excuse me, have you seen my little bug? And people give, give him the look that, you know, you would get on the street in Dublin if you asked this, right? But, but then they get helicoptered in to the top of the massif, and they bring all this stuff with them. And I should say that on this expedition, there was so much enthusiasm that in addition to the people who go to the field a lot, a lot of out of shape entomologists who don't go to the field a lot also joined up. And this becomes important later because what they're doing is they get helicoptered to the, the massif and then they're gonna walk out. And so they get there and they start to look for an insect that is about this big in the middle of the desert. And so they look, and they look, and they look. And this is about the point when they start to question the trip. Some of them start to question their relationships. <laughs> Others question their whole life work. And they keep looking, and they keep looking, and they keep looking. And then all of a sudden, there's one of these creatures alive. And it is. For an, for an entomologist, it's totally different. It's a new thing. And so they're super excited. And then they round a corner, and then there's another species. And, and so it's this great moment. It's this great discovery. And now they've just got to hike out and tell the world what they've found. The problem is it's arduous. And now they've got a whole bunch of insects in these little baskets that they want to carry out. And so they start hiking out, and it proves too much. And so they start to leave clothes behind. They leave food behind. And I picture them hiking out like just in their underpants, but with just these insects on their heads, that they're not leaving the insects. And if they got to go naked to keep the insects, they're going to do it. And so they finally make it home. <laughs> and because Oliver's a grad student uh, who is still young and impressionable, he decides that the best name for this insect is the gladiator insect, because that's what he was watching when he first thought to look for it. 
and that sticks. And because he's an entomologist, the way he presents it to the world is he draws pictures of its genitalia, which is what you see on the other side. And so he presents this to the world, the gladiator insect and its genitalia, and what he hopes is that the newspapers all around the world are going to say, Oliver, I can't believe what you've done. This is amazing. And to a great extent, this is what happens. The New York Times carries an article. It's in Time Magazine. It's a big deal, a big branch of the evolutionary tree of life. But then something funny happens, which is that other people look in their junk drawers because they think, I think I've seen the genitals of an insect like this before. <laughs> and when they do, it turns out it's not just on the Brandberg Massif, but it's all over dry parts of Africa, including in abandoned lots in Cape Town, including places like this here, which is an abandoned lot right behind a school. And so to me, this is this amazing part to this story, which is that a kid could have discovered this new order of insects. And this story goes on, and Peter comes back, and he tells me it, and it gets written about. And then Peter goes back to South Africa again, after some of this has been unveiled. And I thought I would write about this story in that, that book, Every Living Thing, but it didn't fit, because somehow it was simultaneously too central and not resolved. And so Peter goes back to South Africa. He's in Cape Town. Peter hates cities and people, and he likes Katie Dids and being out of cities. And so we got to ride with a trucker, and he stops at a truck stop, and all he wants to do is to get away and go look for insects. And at the truck stop, while the trucker is peeing, Peter gets out of the truck and looks in a bush, and in the bush, at the truck stop, he founds a pregnant gladiator insect and four new species of katydids. <laughs> and so this, to me, was the resolution of this story. But this was a really important story to me as a graduate student because it had these very important lessons. One was that they, we miss amazing phenomena all around us. I mean, you don't even have to like insects to know that finding a totally new branch in the tree of life is a pretty big deal, and that a kid could have done it. But the other piece is that in order to discover those things, to see those phenomena, it often requires that we assume nobody else knows. Because that's really what Oliver did. He opened the drawer, saw this thing, and he assumed nobody else knew what it was. And so this was incredibly sort of stimulating to me as a grad student about what, in terms of what I could discover. But what took, took me a long time to realize was that this is also part of applied discovery. If we want to do great applications, make great medical discoveries, do better medicine, do better discovery of enzymes, that this is part of that story too. And the thesis for my talk today in the context of microbes and all the life around us is really that the value to humanity is huge of linking diversity, discovery, natural history, the, the frameworks of ecology and evolution, and coupling that with a sense of what human needs are. That we need to do this to make big discoveries. We need to couple our sense of what we need immediately with this basic work out in the Brandberg Massif. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to work through this thesis in the context of examples, of stories, because that's what I do. In honor of the science gallery, there's also a lurking hypothesis, which is that art often plays a disproportionate role in these discoveries, too. This, this so happens to be a great Vermeer painting, which is just down the street. And we know that Vermeer and Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the great the father of microbiology, they interacted in one way or another. And, and I think it's plausible that they influenced each other back and forth. The artist influenced the, the amateur scientist in terms of what he looked at, and the amateur scientist influenced the artist in terms of his use of lenses. But I think this happens again and again, and I'll try to shed light on those lenses when they come up in the context of the story. But now back to the library and the context of writing about these stories. One of the contexts I've been writing about a lot is in the context of the human heart. Now, the human heart seems very far removed from the Brandberg Massive because if the Massive is one of the least studied places on Earth, the heart clearly is one of the most studied things. And I think the reality is that this is entirely wrong. And I'm going to show you some evidence that this is wrong in the context of stories. The first is a story about this guy, Akira Ando, who grew up in Japan. His formative years are just after World War II. He grows up hungry in a poor family 
where collecting mushrooms ends up being a huge part of where they get food. And so knowing mushrooms is a big part of his childhood. And so he decides early on that he wants to help people and that somehow he wants to do that with mushrooms. And he wants to do it with, with mushrooms and with other fungi. He's thinking about this in the context of the work by Alexander Fleming, in the context of the work that leads to the discovery of antibiotics. I think we, many of us have heard the story of Fleming. The one we hear is that he accidentally leaves the sandwich out. The sam sandwich grows penicillin fungus. That fungus leads him to think about the wars between fungus and bacteria, and he then discovers antibiotics. The actual story is way more interesting and involves these pictures that you see at the right. It turns out that Fleming was fascinated by art, and he was treating lots of syphilis patients who were disproportionately artists, and so they gave him art supplies. And so he thought, what kind of art could I do that they couldn't do? And so he started to do art with bacteria. And so he would inoculate specific strains and species of bacteria at the precise time that they would all grow up to make these pictures. And he was terribly excited about them and loved them. And he actually showed the top one to the queen. And he said it was her. And she didn't respond super favorably. Maybe some of the details lost in time. But in any case, one of the things he had to do in order to make these paintings was he had to keep an eye out for unusual bacteria that might help him. And he wanted things with weird colors that grew in weird ways. And so he was always leaving things out. He was always cultivating the unusual. And so it's really in that context that he discovers the war between, between fungi and bacteria that ultimately leads to the, the first antibiotics. And I, so I think that's an interesting story in the context of the, the gallery. And this is actually a, one of the first plates he looked at. And so you have the bacterial growth, you have the penicillium colony, and you have this space in between them, this sort of artistic space where the, where the penicillium colony is producing antibiotics that are killing the bacteria. As Endo thought about this, he started to think about what were all the other ways in which fungi could do useful things that might be in the service of humanity. And if fungi and bacteria have been at war for hundreds of millions of years, maybe he could think cleverly about ways to use the fungi. And so the first job he ever gets is actually with this in mind. He was working on uh, wines and fruit juices which had too much pectin in them, which is part of, it's a residue from the peel, from the plant itself. And so his boss said, can you get rid of the pectin? And so the first thing he thought was, well, I'll try and see if there's a fungus that naturally does this. And so he went out and just looked for fungi in the wild that were growing on fruits, and he found one really very quickly. And so this is still used in production of, of ciders and, and some wines to get rid of the pectin. But this emboldened him, and he thought, where else could fungi be useful? And for reasons not totally clear, he eventually comes to think that maybe in the context of, think, of the the balance of compounds in the body. And it was about this time that he went to the US and he saw lots of people with heart problems. And he started to think, well, if these heart problems are due to too much cholesterol, clogging of the arteries, maybe there's a fungus that actually f fights bacteria by interfering with the production of, of cholesterol, and maybe I could use that fungus to alter the, the status of these people with too much cholesterol. And, it, and what he, in essence, wanted to alter was this enzymatic reaction. And so he goes out and starts to look for fungi that might do this. And he happens to have 6,000 fungal strains because of long-standing collections of fungi in Japan, because of basic biology, and he starts going through them one by one. And in 1971, after about eight years of work, he finally finds one called citronin, which seems to interfere with the production of cholesterol and seems to work. And so he thinks this is the big deal. This is going to change everything. And then he gives it to rats, and it gives the rats kidney stones. And so he has to start over. He starts over. He gets through another 3,000. And in 1973, he has another one that works in the lab, but it doesn't work in rats. And so his boss tells him to give up, that he's done nothing useful in now eight or 10 years. And he happens to talk to a friend who's got some chickens. And, he says, and Akira Endo says, can I borrow your chickens? 
His friend says, well, yeah, but you sort of seem more like a guy who's going to kill him, and then I don't want him back. But okay. And so he tries it in the chickens, and it works. It reduces the cholesterol in those chickens. None of them suffer heart attacks. And this is a big deal. Suddenly he feels like he's on to something. This becomes the precursor to statins. I, I won't ask for a raise of hands, but I would guess about this many people in this room are on statins or some derivative to lower cholesterol. This is how they were discovered. They were discovered in the context of the basic evolutionary biology of thousands of fungi species. And they produced this wonderful gift from nature that's really changed the course of how we think about heart disease. And they're overused, but still, especially in partnership with other treatments, have reduced the number of deaths due to cardiac heart disease dramatically. Another heart example, heart transplants. Heart transplants are this amazing, amazing thing where we take the heart from one person and we put it in another person. It's inconceivable that, that this happens. And yet the other day I was talking to a group and a young woman came up after and she, she was asking about college, where she sh should go. And then she said, by the way, I've had a heart transplant. And it's a by the way. Right, it's not I'm a heart tra transplant recipient, it's I'm thinking about college by the way. And so this to me is just miraculous. But where does this miracle come from? Well, it starts with this heart transplant surgery, which was a success. And Christian Barnard, who did this, became an international superhero. He slept with movie stars. He was on Time magazine. His wife really didn't like the sleeping with movie stars thing. But the thing that people forget about this first transplant is that it was a success for Barner, but not so much for the patient who lived 18 days. And in fact, what would proceed to happen over the next decade is that almost all of the many heart transplants that were attempted were unsuccessful. They were successful for the doctors, not for the patients. And people raced to be the first to do one in Germany, in the US, in New Jersey, in southern New Jersey, I say it in jest a little bit, but it wasn't in jest. That's really what happened. And they were so unsuccessful that by the early 70s, there was a call for a moratorium. We just shouldn't do this. It's not working. And then a miraculous thing happens. In 1980, cyclosporine, an immunosuppressant drug, starts to be used to suppress the immune system of the recipient of heart transplants. And this changes everything. And there's a lot more to this story, but this is the key event. And so that was the end of the story, as most people tell it about heart transplants, that a fungus was discovered in the soil that produces this drug. That fungus allows us to do transplants in general. It wasn't until about 10 years ago that anybody looked at the biology of this fungus to think about why would a fungus produce a drug that could be used to suppress human immune systems and change the whole story of, of transplantation. Nobody ever went looking for this story, in fact. The only reason we know it is because Kathy Hodge, a fungal biologist at Cornell University, one weekend thought, you know what would be fun this weekend? Is I would like to go through the student collections of fungi and grow out the ones that are from cow poop and see what they look like in their different life history stages. I mean, some people go running. Mycologists do this. And so she does this with a, with a fungus that's growing on a beetle larvae that's found in cow poop. And when she does this, she's in for a surprise that this fungus is, in fact, cordyceps subsilis. Now, the cordyceps fungi are the fungi that take over the brains of insects and make them do things. Some of them take over the brains of ants and make them crawl high places so the fungus can sprout out of its head. Some take over the, the brains of beetle larvae and make them crawl into feces so the fungus can grow through the feces. This so happens to be one of the latter. In order to do this, these fungi have to take over not only the nervous system, but also the immune system of these insects. It so happens when Kathy looked in more detail that this is also the fungus that produces cyclosporine. And so it's now very clear that the reason it works as an immunosuppressant 
is that it actually evolved to suppress immune systems, aspects of the immune systems of animals that are so deep and fundamental that we actually share attributes of them with insects. And so one can speculate as to whether heart transplants would have worked earlier had we looked in organisms like this for immunosuppressants in the first place. Another example in the context of the heart. When we look at other primates, we tend to think of them as, as, as sharing many things with us. And among those things are ways of dying. Right? We look at the chimps at the zoo and we, we share this deep primateness. You know, you look in their eyes and they're like us and we're like them. And medically, that tends to be the assumption. That's why we still use chimps in, in uh, medical facilities, right? That, that's why they're still there. That's why there's this debate, because of our sameness. But it turns out we've not looked very well. And so this not looking also applies to the heart. And so to the extent that anybody thought about it, if you would have asked, do chimps suffer heart attacks? The answer clearly is yes, they do. Sometimes they just fall over in the cage or in the forest, dead of a heart attack. And so if you would ask the second question, is it caused by the same thing as, as the cause of human heart attacks, clogging of the coronary arteries? The answer was definitely yes, although nobody looked. It had to be yes. And it wasn't until about 2005 that somebody started to look. Nissi Varki and Ajit Varki at the University of San Diego started to look at chimp hearts that were in parafilm wax and in collections that had died of different causes. And they found, sure enough, there were chimps that had died of heart attacks. But the weird discovery was that those heart attacks were of a kind never ever seen in humans, a cross-linking of the muscles. And so the first mystery was what causes that. No one has any idea and there's no research on it. The second mystery was why they don't get the kind of heart attack we get. And so the first assumption was, well, chimps just have low cholesterol or they have you know, high good cholesterol and low bad cholesterol. But when you look, it turns out that chimps have terrible cholesterol from a human perspective. If a chimp walked into a hospital and everybody got over the whole, there's a chimp walking into a hospital thing, a chimp would almost certainly, even a baby chimp would be given statins. And so it's not the cholesterol. And so this suddenly raises the mystery of what's killing the, the chimps that's not what kills us and why is what's killing us different from what's killing the chimps. And the truth is, we actually don't have an answer to this yet. But if we get one, it's going to be from this, the study of the context, the study of the evolution of this deeper biology. The other question this raises is how ancient is the fact that we tend to get clogged coronary arteries? And for the most part, the medical community has assumed that the answer is about since like the 1940s when we started to sit more and eat more crappy things. Like that, it wasn't a big body of work that studied this, but everybody thought, sure, that was it. And then a group of people started to do, I wasn't flipping my slides, I got excited. So there's a chimp that's died, and this is the difference in the hearts. A group of scientists started to look at mummies. And now the assumption would be that if you look at mummies, they should have nice, clean coronary arteries that should look like brand new pipes, the kind of thing you just want to sh push blood through. And so the first mummies that were examined were Egyptian mummies. And the Egyptian mummies had tons of coronary clogs. They looked like guys from New Jersey. And so then people said, well, it's something about the fancy mummies, the pharaohs, they, they were just like us. They didn't have Wendy's and they didn't have biscuits, but otherwise they were the same. It turns out that almost all the mummies anybody has looked at show evidence of coronary clogs. Not always with the same frequency as us, but always with a much greater frequency than the chimps. And so suddenly this is another medical mystery, a mystery that again is not totally solved, but a mystery only presented by the context. To go to things I've written about from my other book th that was really not focused on the heart, but the body in general. I became really interested in the story of Toxoplasma gondii. It causes toxoplasmosis. Anybody know, when, when do you get told about toxoplasmosis? Yeah, so if, if you're pregnant, you're not supposed to mess around with kitty litter, right? Or I guess you should never mess around with kitty litter. But if you're pregnant, you shouldn't change the kitty litter. And the reason is 
that you can get infected as part of this cycle. And, it, and that's mostly the only time we hear about Toxoplasma gondii. But to people of my tribe, basic ecologists and evolutionary biologists, we've heard about it in a long time, for a long time in another context. Because it turns out that this is a cool parasite. It gets into mice and rats, and then it gets into cats, and it reproduces only in cats. And this is a weird lifestyle unless you're in a cartoon. If you're in a cartoon and you can guarantee that you get from a mouse or a rat into a cat, then it's, you know, the odds are high. But the average mouse or rat probably spends a pretty low chance of ending up in a cat. And so how does this work? Well, it turns out that the mice and rats have brains the performance of which is altered by this parasite. And so when the parasite is present, the mice and rats are less scared, they're less vigilant of predators, they're attracted to the smell of cat pee, and they're more likely to get eaten by a cat. And we now know this happens in part because the parasite's actually producing the precursors to dopamine in specific parts of the brains of the mice and the rats. And so for me, as a basic biologist, this was an amazing story. Look what evolution can do. It can totally mess with mice. But it was a basic story. It wasn't a human story. And the only reason we know about this is because of basic funding to obscure biologists you've never heard of. But there's a funny thing about this parasite, which is sometimes we get infected via another route. Sometimes we get infected by eating meat that's not fully cooked. And so when this happens, we can aim, actually get the same life history stage that a mouse or a rat gets. And so at least in theory, and in circus performers, the parasite could go through us to find a fruitful and reproductive life in a cat. But of course, this is silly because we don't get eaten by cats very much, and it's not part of the story of the parasite, and we're smart, right? I mean, we can do lots of clever things. We can build cities and rooms and make projectors and the whole deal. And so we, we are not part of this story, except that in the last 10 years, as people have started to look at what happens when you get infected by Toxoplasma gondii, it becomes clear that we are part of this story. The people who are infected show increased activity, decreased reaction times, and altered personality profiles. These personality tests you take that identify like who you are, what type you are, get infected by Toxoplasma gondii, and your answers change. You're two and a half times more likely to get into a car accident if you've been infected, and the single best predictor of the onset of schizophrenia in long-term military studies is infection by this parasite. And so suddenly, this is a different kind of story, the basics of which we only know about because of basic biology. But still, you might say, don't mess with the kitty litter, don't eat uncooked meat, and it's not my story. Except that in Ireland, about 35 to 40% of you are infected. And so which ones? Who, who is having their personality, their behavior, their essence altered by this parasite? And even more than that, it turns out <laughs> that upwards of 80% of the French are infected. This could be explain the behavior of an entire people. <laughs> and all of this comes from basic biology. And so what I'm arguing through these stories is that the context matters. Knowing about the natural history of these organisms matters. Knowing about their ecology and evolution. And we need to know it when we figure out their practical relevance. We need to couple it with that practical relevance. And that takes time. It takes basic study. It takes even knowing about obscure things like this. But does it work? Can we put this into practice in a bigger way? And so the good thing about being a science writer and a scientist is I can go back to my lab and try. And so this is what we've tried to do, is to take a systematic approach to thinking about how we use ecology, natural history, and evolution to do applied work. We're not doing the applied work, but we're doing work that we think we can meet up with applied people on and have applied insight. And so to do this, we think about our evolutionary history, we think about other societies that have already met our challenges, and we look in light of all these species you're breathing in right now. Did I mention there's a fungus that's in all of your lungs and we have no idea what it does? There is. I actually think it's a beneficial fungus. 
basically nobody studies it. It eats steroids. It's there. Um, but that would be a good target. We're not studying it. What are we doing in the lab? We're thinking about revolutionary history in the context of obscure places like your belly button. So we started a project that first was all about public engagement called the Belly Button Biodiversity Project, in which we sought to engage people in sampling their own belly buttons for microbes with the idea that this was a great context in which to talk about microbiomes, you know, those suites of microbes that live in a particular place, and to talk about the fact that we know that they're beneficial, that if you cleaned all the microbes off your skin, you would die. You would die within a week because you would be infected by a pathogen. We, we know these things are valuable. This is a context in which to talk about them. But as we started to sample people, other things happened. First, artists started to work with us, which was super fun. So this is Joanna Rousseau, and she does these great images of people as a function of their microbes. And so this is Joanna, this is Joanna as a function of her microbes. And one of the things that she presented to us that was really great in the context of this work is the reality that most of the time when we encounter each other, we're encountering our microbes first. And so close your eyes for just one second. And smell. All of the smells of your neighbor are microbial. And so while with our eyes we focus on the, the appearance of our own cells, with our noses really we're picking up this other life. And so this is what our noses pick up. This is what our eyes pick up. And so that was a super interesting way to think about this. But then the science became interesting too. And it was all basic science for the most part, thinking about how many species live in your belly button, hundreds, what they might be doing, how they vary from person to person and why. But then the other thing that became clear is it's these microbes that determine whether or not mosquitoes bite you. And so suddenly, this was kind of interesting from an applied angle. We're not going to work on the mosquitoes, but we're working on which microbes you have and why, and these two things meet up. And then we started thinking about the history of these microbes. And it turned out that nobody had ever studied the skin microbes of non-human primates. There's not a single paper. This was weird, and so we did it. And so this, this graph just shows you the relative composition of different kinds of microbes in humans uh, and then other primates. And one of the neat things that you see is that they vary. And this blue, that's carinobacterium. That's what makes armpits stinky. It's fed by a specific gland in your armpit that has no other function than to feed these microbes. Super slow growing. Turns out it's actually more abundant on chimps and gorillas than it is on humans, and that we have way more of Staphylococcus, which includes bad ones and good ones. Well, that was kind of intriguing. We also figured out that zookeepers are actually more like chimps and gorillas, and we only know that because one zookeeper kept calling to say, look, I smell like a gorilla, I'm having trouble dating. What do you know? She has gorilla microbes. I'm a basic biologist, I can't fix it. Um, but then the other thing that we started to do was to compare people, because there was all, there's a lot of variation among people. And so we compared people who use antiperspirants to those that don't and to those who use deodorants. And then we did an experiment where we asked people to stop using them. And what we got out of this, just as a quick take home, is that the people who use antiperspirant have way less of the carinobacterium, that, that ape bacteria, and, and they have more staphylococcus. And so what this now suggests to us is that the predominance of Staphylococcus, which is our normal medical skin microbe, on humans may in part be due to the predominance of the use of antiperspirants and deodorants. And so this is what we're exploring now. Is this interesting? Almost certainly from an infection standpoint, because these microbes in your skin influence what your, inf your risk of infection. But also from the perspective of the mosquitoes, because it turns out that Staphylococcus is one of the bacteria that most attracts mosquitoes. And so have we artificially favored bacteria that make us more tasty to mosquitoes? Maybe. And so we're now working to think about, can we find the microbes that do the opposite and develop probiotics? We won't do that, but we've engaged the applied biologists who can think about that. We never would have thought about that without this context. Another example, face mites. Raise your hand if you have them. 
Right, so we recently discovered that everybody has them. We didn't know that because nobody studied these for the most part, except for one person in Dublin, um, since the 1960s. And all that study was based on just looking at them. And so we know very little about these mites. And we didn't even know how many people had them. And so we've started to use genetic approaches to look at these mites. And one of the bets I'd had for years was that if you sampled a group of people this big for their face mites, these are animals that are living in the follicles on your head, right? We should know about them. But they don't kill us, and we can't eat them, and so nobody funds it. Um, but, but so they, they, they seem as though something we should study. But we haven't. And so I bet that if you sampled a room this big, you would find new species of these mites. And in fact, that's what we found. In the first 40 people we sampled, we found lineages. This is just an evolutionary tree. The mites don't focus on it in detail other than to note there's this one really long branch, which is to mean we're finding these lineages that are really, really different from geographically different populations. And it looks as though these mites track all our human history. The other thing that's interesting from these mites is that they've been thought to be implicated in, the, in rosacea. But they clearly don't cause it because everybody's got the mites. And so what's going on? And so it's been speculated it's their, fecal, it's their microbes because they don't have an anus, and so they just fill up with feces and then disintegrate. Um, happening right now. And so it was thought that it's just the mites, but that's wrong. And so what it, we're now looking at is the possibility that people with rosacea have picked up a mite from another species. And so they're generating an immune response to this mite from another mammal species. But in order to really do that, we have to know what mites are on other mammal species. And although it's known that there are mites on chimps and gorillas, no one's collected them, and so we don't even know what they are. And so we're starting to do that. A bonus art lesson. In order to do this work, we wanted to produce art that people would sort of feel captivated by, like that kids could look at and think, oh, that mite is interesting. And so we went to get scanning electron micrographs of the mites at the American Museum of Natural, or the American Museum of Natural History. And so we went to get these pictures really just to, do, to show people to, so they could see. And we actually did a giant cutout of one of the mites that somebody here has had a picture taken in. But when we went, a funny thing happened. We saw things we knew about their biology. They have cute toes that are clamoring over you right now. They have no anus, which is why they kind of explode when full. I had a cousin like that. <laughs> but then there was a really weird thing, which is that we've known since 1920 that they chew at the cells in your follicles, and that's how they eat. But that would presuppose that they have some mouth part with which to chew. And it turned out that no one had looked. And that in doing art, we discovered they have no mouth part with which to chew, and they appear to suck. They have a vacuum face. I have a cousin like that, too. <laughs> and we only know this because we needed to do art to engage kids. And so this is just another way of showing that these application-adjacent things are possible and done better in the context of evolutionary history. The other thing we're doing is looking to other societies. These are carrion beetles. They take dead stuff, they roll it into a ball, and they put their babies in it. Um, it's one of the best examples of paternal care in animals. But one of the amazing things about this that I've known for a long time but never really thought about is that when they do this, the carrion stops smelling. You can have this done in your lab. You can have tons of these beetles and balls of dead animal meat in your lab, and it doesn't smell bad. What this means is that they're manipulating the microbial environment in ways to benefit themselves, and they're almost certainly using interesting antibiotics. And so we're now looking to these beetles for those antibiotics. We're also looking in light of all these species you breathe in every day that live on you, that live with you, to try to figure out what we know about them, but also in what ways they might be useful in light of their ecology. And so we've started sampling homes around the world. And this, this in and of itself has been interesting because I'm just interested in what, what lives with us and how that's changed through time. And the first thing we did to do this was we just did something really obvious. We asked people to take pictures of, well, the first, first we just asked them, do you have these in your house? Does anybody have these, camel cricket? They're mostly blind with long antennae. If you walk in the dark into your basement, they jump at you. 
People don't like them so much. Um, I love them. But we asked people, do you have these? And then one day we got these responses because we did this digitally. And the white dots are people who said they did not have them and the red dots are people who said they had them. And this map is wrong because the people just didn't understand somehow. Because we know that actually these camel crickets live all across North America. And so our first thought was that people from California are scared of things. And so just wouldn't admit that they had them. And so we said, we went back to the, the picture, to the power of cameras, and we said, well, can you take a picture? And when we asked people to do that, we were in for a surprise. Instead of the little camel cricket we expected, almost all of these pictures were of a giant thumb-sized camel cricket we didn't know lived in basements in the US that's been introduced from Japan and spread unnoticed basement to basement all the way from Boston to Iowa. And we didn't know because everybody else thought somebody knew. <laughs> and so we started to think, because people said, well, what use is it? And as an ecologist, I just love these species. They're fascinating. I mean, I love their stories. And that, that question bristles. But I thought, all right, what use could it be? And so I started thinking, and we thought, well, these are animals that eat the worst stuff you have in your house. They eat paint. They eat old carpet. They eat each other. Maybe they have in their guts microbes that, allow, that would allow them to break down, really hard to break down compounds. Maybe those microbes could be the same kinds of microbes we need in an industrial context. And so we talked to some people who do industrial microbiology and said, what's the biggest challenge you've got? And one of the answers we heard was that when you make paper, one of the end products is this stuff called black liquor. And it's the hardest to break down plant material combined with all the toxic things used to make the paper. And it mostly goes into rivers or gets burned. And so she, the industrial microbiologist said, if we had a microbe that could deal with this, we could make energy from it and get rid of pollution. And so we thought, let's try and see if these crickets have microbes that could do that. And on the first try, we got eight separate, separate strains of microbes from these camel crickets able to break down this black liquor, which then suggests to us that if there are more insects in houses, we're going to look at them too. And so we wanted to know what else was there. And so we go into houses, and we thought we would find tens of species. And in the first 50 houses we surveyed, we found over 2,000 species of insects. Looks like this, because all our work is done at the museum with the public, sometimes kids on the inside of the glass, sometimes on the outside. This is a breakdown of the kinds of things we're finding in terms of abundance, lots of flies and beetles and ants, lots of beetles in terms of diversity. Also crazy things, this spider spits silk on its prey. It doesn't make a web, it just walks around, it sees something edible, it spits at it. I had a cousin like that. <laughs> it only lives indoors. This is the smallest cricket in the world that was in my kitchen. And so we're starting to find neat stuff. And then we thought, oh, we're missing the microbial piece. We're missing the microbiome of the home. And so we start to sample that. And so we sample all of these habitats, or really the participants in our projects do. And then we get a breakdown of which species live in these habitats. And so this is a kind of map, and I'm almost done here, of the composition of species in different homes. And the closer together two points are, the more similar the species that live in them. And so two blue dots that are close together have almost the same species. And so one thing to notice is that if you look at door trim, those, those samples tend to be similar to each other, right? And that's in part because they're picking out outdoor microbes. If you look at the green stuff, that's food-associated microbes. That purple dot in the middle of the green stuff that's somebody who had hamburger on their TV. <laughs> I actually think it is. Um, and then there's this part nobody likes, which is the top right, which is the fact that we can't distinguish microbially between your pillowcase and your toilet seat. <laughs> Amazingly, what we can distinguish is whether it's a man's or a woman's. <laughs> and so this is just a measure of what's in there. And then we thought once we'd sampled the first 50 houses that we would go big. And so we've now worked with people all across the US to sample the microbes in all of these houses. And in this study, we've now found over 240,000 species. 
We have found more kinds of fungi inside homes than there are named fungi in North America. Inside homes. And what's amazing is on the basis of these samples, we can map species. And so this is a weird fungus of uh, beehives. It was not known to be in the U.S. We now know it's there. This is uh, the yeast we use in making bread. We find it in people's houses. This is a yeast to making sourdough bread. I mean, this is a bacteria used in making sourdough bread. We can do plants now. And so when we do Colorado, we find lots of marijuana DNA in the house. <laughs> Literally true. And so we can do this. And so we're doing lots of biology on the basis of this. We're doing lots of basic biology. We want to figure out what makes a place special, you know, the tewa of the home, where tewa is the set of special characteristics that the geography, geology, and climate of a certain place interacting with plant genetics express and agricultural products such as wine, coffee, chocolate, hops, tomatoes, heritage, wheat, cheese, and tea, and I think, and human daily life. And I think tewa is mostly microbial, right? And so what's your tewa? This is what we're measuring. And we're doing it in the context of global samples and of chimpanzee nests because we want to know this big picture. But the interesting thing is that as we've done this, people have come to us thinking about application. Many applications we could have thought of and some we never, ever would have thought of. And the most recent application was the question, could you tell us where a sample was from if you knew which species were in it? We thought, no way, wouldn't be possible, but we tried. Turns out we can. And so the red dots are where a sample comes from. The black dots are where we predict it comes from based just on the fungi present in the sample. A sample like that. We can get on average within 100 kilometers in predicting where a bunch of dust comes from just based on which fungi are in it. This has tremendous forensics application. This is nothing we would ever have done just doing application straight ahead. We needed this context. And so this is what we do again and again. This isn't so useful yet, but I think somebody's going to tell me how it's useful. We can also tell if you have a cat or a dog in your home. 95% um, accuracy with a dog, not quite as accurate with a cat. And that's drool and feces and what they bring on their feet. And so to come back to my thesis, what I'm arguing here collectively is that we miss amazing phenomena all around us every day. And if you're 10 years old, there's more cool stuff to discover than we know so far. And we have the tools now. And so I really think it's one of the greatest moments in the history of discovery. That seeing those phenomena often requires assuming nobody else knows. We would have assumed for sure that somebody else had studied the skin microbes of other primates. There's no way that no one has. And then finally, that the value to humanity requires linking discovery, natural history, eco-evolutionary theory, and human needs and all of which tend to be considered by different people. And so a big part of how we make this work is that we do all this work with the public, the public that asks us questions, the public that begs of us things, but also with people who do an application, who know about what we might need in an applied sense. That the silos in science are so deep, if we don't do this, we'll never get to these discoveries. If I was a really good speaker, this is where I would come around and tell you that this new insect lineage helped to cure cancer. I'm not that good. But what this, this gladiator insect does remind us of is that we won't know if something like this cures cancer unless we know something about it. And right now, even though we've discovered this order of insects, we know too little about it to even think about how it might be useful. That's not even mentioning the fact that on it and in it are hundreds of other species we know even less about. And here I'll offer a provocation, which is a provocation about the number of species on Earth, something I've spent a fair amount of time studying, but that we've kind of abandoned recently. Linnaeus estimated there might be 12,000, and he thought he would name them all. And by he, he meant his students, and he would take credit. <laughs> there are about 2 million species named today. The most conservative estimate anybody has offered is that there are 8 million species out there today, which is to say six out of every eight things you bump into does not have a name. My personal, so Terry Irwin estimated there might be 100 million. My personal provocation is there could be as many as 200 million. 
And the amazing thing about this is we know so little that even if I'm totally full of it, we're not going to know for 500 years. Which is to say, unless we know something about those other species, they'll never become part of how we think about use and value. And so I'll close here. Realize I got to the end of my three hours. Um, and, and I'll thank you for coming tonight. I know it's beautiful outside, and you could be playing Frisbee or looking for